that your people may rejoice in you. Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. On the 10th anniversary of an event that shaped our country, I could think of no better way than to ask God to fulfill his word by simply joining together in prayer for the next minute or so and asking God, quote, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love. Grant us your salvation. Let's pray. I thank you, Father, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You were as faithful ten years ago as you are now. And for that, we praise you. For those families that gather together, still reeling from the sense of loss with names being read and embraces being had please comfort in a way that only you can your word declares you're the God of comfort it's the father of mercy oh God how we need you to be that for us father we don't ask you this morning for anything that you haven't already revealed in your word that's in your heart. The psalmist, the sons of Korah, in the years of King David, almost a thousand years B.C., had this as their petition. Will you not revive us again? Father, will you not revive us again? that we, your gathered people across this land, would see a sovereign movement of God in our day. God, will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you. Father, you are our joy, our glory, our crown. And we desire to come to you. We ask, Father, that you show us your unfailing love. Not because we deserve it, but because of your great grace. Without your unfailing love, Father, we are, we have, and can do nothing. So, Father, once again, in the words of the psalmist, would you not grant us your salvation? In this day of remembrance, in this day of reflection, in this day of beginning, Father, our prayer is simple. Heal our land. Revive us again for the praise of your glory, for the sake of your name, for the expanse of your kingdom. Father, we pray this simply in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, you know, ten years ago, I was teaching a Bible study on that Tuesday morning when things were being normal. And you know, they stopped being normal not just for me, but also really for our country. Because if you remember what happened in those few days that followed 9-11, churches, places of worship across the country were absolutely flooded with people. You remember that? How long did that last? Maybe a few weeks, and then when things got back to normal... We did what normal people normally do. 
And unfortunately, that was relegate God to the back burner once again. Well, you know what? It's time to get him off the back burner and not only put him on the front burner, recognize he is the burner. Amen? Amen. All right. It's time to turn back again. And it's time to celebrate who God is because Malachi 3.6 says, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you are not destroyed. We have an unchanging God. And I rejoice this morning that our God does not change. And I rejoice that that God has been consistent in calling us back to himself as he is doing this very moment. You know, if you've ever been in my office, you know that I love to read. I guess, Alan, I'm one of those guys that loves to read. I have read many, many books in my lifetime. Some of them I even remember. <laughs> or should. Few of those, and it's becoming fewer the older I get, I could tell you where something exactly is on a page, tell you the page it's on, and go right there and get it for you. Fewer books yet have stopped me in my tracks. And fewer books yet have demanded that I reread them for clarity. The book Radical by David Platt is one of those books that fits the latter category. It stopped me. And it wasn't even my idea. Where's David Longer? I know you're here. I come in this morning. It's your fault. David Longren gave me a copy of Radical several months ago, and I read it three times and handed it on to somebody else. David, I have no idea where it's at, so I bought you a new one. Okay? So don't, don't get out this morning without me replacing your copy of it. When I first read it, it stopped me. It caused me to do some reflection, honest evaluation. And I, I want to be honest with you this morning. The first time I read it, I wanted to throw it away. <laughs> that's, that's, that's just being gut level honest first time I read it I didn't like it I wanted to pitch it now here's a disclaimer I don't agree with everything in the book then again I've never agreed with everything in any book I've ever read including this one because there are things God tells me to do I don't want to do it right okay but I was challenged by it. I came back to it. I wanted to chew on it. And the reason I couldn't get away from it, and the reason I didn't like it, is because there was truth in it. And there's something in my flesh that just rebels. And it did. It sparked something that I believed we as a congregation. It sparked something that I needed to chew on. And it sparks something that I think we need a, as a congregation to chew on. Are we going to agree with all of it? No. I don't agree with all of his conclusions. But it was one of those books that demanded a hearing. So here we go. Here's the thesis statement for that whole book. Page 3. Now you can tell me whether or not you agree with this. I am convinced that we as followers, Christ followers in American churches, have embraced values that are not only unbiblical, but actually claim, that actually contradict the gospel we claim to believe. Would you agree? I certainly would. Now, it's quite a statement. First time I read it, I got pretty uncomfortable. And the reason I got uncomfortable, because there's truth in that statement. How many of you have ever heard anything called the prosperity gospel? <laughs> Jesus wants you healthy, wealthy, and wise. You know what? There's only one country in the world you can preach that gospel. And you're living in it. When Nancy and I spent three weeks in Africa earlier this year, I want to tell you, there was no way that gospel, if you would, was going to be preached in anywhere outside the borders of the United States. So we can recognize some of those 
gospel light things. And we can recognize those when we're confronted with them. But you know what? It's not the point. It's the more subtle things that we embrace without really thinking about them. That we need to pull again, not into the light of a human book, but in light of the divine revelation of the Word of God. This is the primary filter. It is the only filter through which we can know absolute truth. Jesus prays in John 17, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your Word is truth. Thank you. John 17, 17. So we need to start this morning with the call of Jesus Christ. It is a very pointed call. It is a challenging call. It was challenging to the primary audience. It's challenging to us. Father, let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable in your sight. Teach us truth, Father. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go to Luke 14. We're going to read verses 25 and 26. As you turn into that, it's also in the connection, it'll be on the screen, but if you got your sword, get it out. This teaching of Jesus follows on the heels of Jesus teaching an extended parable on the excuses that people make why they should not be part of the kingdom of God. I've married a house, or I've married, I got a new field I got to check out, got some ox I got to go try. Lord, there's really significant reasons why I can't be involved in the kingdom. And on the heels of that, Jesus says this. Luke records that large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to him, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and his children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, does that sound like a call to radical surrender to you? Those of you who did not respond, are you awake enough to engage? Does that call sound like a radical call to submission? Well, let me make a few observations right off the top. I want to make sure we understand this passage very clearly. So here's number one. Jesus knew large crowd. Yeah, don't you do that to me yet. You get back there. No. It's not one of those good techno days so far. Jesus knew large crowds is not where it was at. Doesn't mean that large crowds, mega churches, those are not bad. But numbers in and of itself is not where the heart of Jesus is. He knew people following for the wrong reason was not where it's at. Large crowds were traveling with them. If you flip, then you don't have to do it, but if you read the, a, a parallel story in the Gospel of John, the sixth chapter, right after Jesus fights, feeds the 5,000, why did people follow him? Get a free lunch. I've not been known to turn down many free lunches. Matter of fact, Nancy and I are available after lunch, after service today, if you feel so inclined. Jesus knew numbers isn't where it was at. He knew simply being in his company was not where it was at. He cuts to the heart of the matter. Why? He cuts to the heart of the matter because it is a matter of the heart. And he has to address it at that level. Because the heart is the key. What are inappropriate reasons for following Jesus? Think there were people in the crowd that were following for the wrong reasons? You bet there were. Here's what the Lord really impressed on my heart this week. Now Haley. There. There. Why do we follow him? We follow him because he's worthy. And not because the rewards are worth it. Ooh. Did you hear that clearly? Why do we follow Jesus? Now come on. Why do we normally follow Jesus? That's not why we normally follow him. I don't want to go to hell. 
somebody to pay my fire insurance premiums. Is there not the subtle temptation within all of us to follow Jesus for what we get? Oh, yeah. Do you think there were people in the crowd of the, in the day of Jesus that were following him for what they could get? Do you think there's people in the American church that are following Jesus because of what they can get? Are there people in northwest Arkansas that are following Jesus for what they can get? Uh Uh-oh, you see what's happening? (laughs) So what's coming next? Are there people in Spring Creek Fellowship that are following Jesus because of what they can get? On the count of three, point to one of them. No, no, don't do (laughs) Don't do that. Don't do that. (laughs) You see, we've tended to follow Jesus not because he's worthy, We've tended to follow him because we think he's worth it. Ooh. Flip it. Why is that an inadequate reason? Because if I follow Jesus because of what I get, I'm at the center of the gospel and he's not. Ooh. I think I just crossed from preaching to meddling. Meddling is when it becomes personal. My brothers and sisters, we need to step back. Why do we follow Jesus? One reason. What is it? He is worthy. I'm not sure this got it. What is the one reason we follow Jesus? What is the one reason we follow Jesus? You going to let him beat you? There is one reason. Do you hear what I'm saying? What makes faith radical? What makes surrender radical? Not because of what we get, but because he is worthy. And that's it. That's gospel truth. How do I know that? Let's go back to the text. Look at Luke 14. Jesus uses a word that follows his invitation. Come to me, he says. If anyone comes to me, it's his invitation. So if you come to me and you do not hate father, mother, sister, brother, brothers, and the brothers and sisters is perhaps a little bit more understandable. I was the youngest of six. Believe, believe me, I understand that. Jesus uses a very strong word. Matthew defines it more as love less. But let me give you the original Greek word. The CO. It literally means to be indifferent to one out of preference to another. Jesus says, you will be indifferent to everything else out of preference to me. Because I am worthy. Now, brothers and sisters, that is a decision we make every day. Let me prove it to you simply. You all know this is the opening day of the NFL. Or many of you know. Some of you know. Everybody. (laughs) I have a preference to a team. The Bears. Okay. I almost wore blue and orange today just to see if anybody caught it. All right. Now, if somebody comes up to me and talks to me about the Cowboys, I will do this. You know, you give them those glossy over faces. That's being indifferent to one out of preference for another. Jesus says, you're going to come to me? If you're going to come to me, You have to give preference to me. And by every other comparison, everything else is going to look as if it is indifferent. And it doesn't matter what the relationship is in comparison to me, it will be as if it is indifference. Do you understand how hard that was for the audience? Where does he start? If you do not hate, who? 
Your mother and your... What have the, what have the Jewish audience been taught to do? Honor your father and your mother. His wife? What have the Jewish audience been taught? Through marriage and sexual intercourse, you become one. And, and, and even his own children. What do the psalmist teach about children? Their heritage or a blessing from the Lord. They had been taught concepts of honor and oneness and giftedness and heritage. And Jesus says, if you're not going to radically lay that down in indifference out of preference to me, go home. Is that about what we get? That's about him being worthy. What about your own life? If you hang on to your own life, it's about you, it's not him. Ooh, wow. I am not, we are not, we cannot be the center of our own lives by intentional choice. It's the only way we're going to get there. It's whether or not we choose to lay it down. Radical surrender is about giving up on my life before I give up on my Lord. Now that's pretty easy for us. It's pretty easy to say. We talk about carrying our own cross and following Him. and You know, it's kind of funny. It's pretty easy to be a Christian in northwest Arkansas, right? I was at a bookstore the other day and they had Testa Mints. Wow. Is that where we've got to as a culture? <laughs> they do I know? That's great. I'm not knocking any of that. I, it's, I, I'm not. We talk about carrying our own cross, and many times it means we've got to give up our expectations, not the load we're carrying. Am I willing? Am I willing to face death for Christ? You know, that had never entered into my mind. Till year 2000. Nancy and I had the privilege to go to Russia. And be there for just under three weeks. And at that time, things in the, in the old Sover, former Soviet Union in Russia were still a little bit up in the air. I'm the cavalier. I couldn't wait to go. I said, yeah, it's charged. New culture, new, new country. And Nancy stopped me one night as we were talking about it. She said, Rick, I finally come to the point that if God takes our lives when we're in Russia, I'm okay with that. That had never entered my mind. You remember telling me that? <laughs> I mean, she, had, she was going through this big spiritual wrestling match. Oh, God, if you want it. And I'm going, hey, we're going for three weeks. We'll be back. It never entered my mind. Never entered my mind. But she made me stop and think. What are we getting into? Am I ready for this radical call to submission? You know, we've heard this text so long, it's almost meaningless. We're almost hardened to it in our culture. It's time to recover it. Platt says this. I cannot help but think that somewhere along the way we missed what is radical about our faith and replaced it with what is comfortable. Does that describe us? Wish it didn't. We were settling for a Christianity that revolves around catering to ourselves. Yeah? When the central message of Christianity is actually abandoning ourselves. Wow. How much does it cost you in this culture to be a Christian? Be honest. Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. Let's go on to the next picture, Haley. If it comes up the way it should. Let me introduce you to your brother in Christ. His name is Samuel Lulu. Serves the Lord in Tanzania, East Africa. His father was a witch doctor. His father was one of the richest and most powerful men in the area because witch doctors have power. And it's all satanic. 
And he came to Jesus. And he went home and told his dad, I'm a Christian now. His dad went to the lawyer and wrote him out of the will. Samuel responded by going home and leading his mom to Christ. So dad divorced her. They responded by leading his brother to Christ. And dad took all the land away. Samuel said, that's okay, I'm going to become a church planner. Now I want you to notice. Do you see what that is on the, right next to the, to the tent? That's a home. That's a hut. That's where the people he ministers live to, live in. And when he's out in the African bush, in an area that is known for lion and, ch and cheetah attack, he lives in a tent. And the ministry bought him a tent so he wouldn't have to live outside. And Samuel has said repeatedly, I'll serve Jesus every day that I'm alive, but I don't expect to live long enough to die a natural death. Is that radical surrender? What's it cost to be a Christian? You know, because this is my theory. Because it costs us so little to be a Christian. We've tended to make the gospel about us. When you live like that, you know the gospel is not about you. This is what the Apostle Paul says of his own spiritual journey in 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. What is the dominant pronoun of a child? <laughs> me, I, my. If you ever have any doubts of the Christian doctrine of original sin... Visit somebody with a two-year-old. That may be the most precious little child, but I want to tell you, they will show you what original sin is all about. <laughs> and the dominant pronoun is I, me, my. Unfortunately, the dominant pronoun in Christianity has become me. Well, it's time to reverse the trend. Here's the second key. Spiritual maturity happens when I put me in my proper place and Christ in his. What's his proper place? Philippians 2 says, One day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is the exalted one. <laughs> Let me give you a revelation. God, there is God. There is a God. No, there is God. And you ain't him. That's it. <laughs> you don't make that decision once and call it done. You make that decision every day of your life. As a matter of fact, I want to show you what John the Baptist says in John 3.30. This is a spiritual principle. He must become greater and I must become less. That is a principle every one of us is still trying to live out day to day. And its ramifications are startling. Is Jesus becoming greater in me? If he is, it's because I'm becoming less. It's a leadership principle. And I'm investing in Mike so that he can become greater. So that I might become less. Is Mike investing in J-Rod so that Mike could become less as J-Rod becomes greater? That's... Man, that's the leadership principles that we're trying to develop here at Spring Creek. He increase, I decrease. Yes, I know John was the forerunner. He knew his job was to set the stage for Jesus. But this is a principle that we have to live out daily. And only one thing can bring me to that principle. The firm and full conviction that he is worthy. Bottom line, he is worthy. Let me quote David Platt one more time. This brings us to the crucial question for every po professing or potential follower for Jesus. Do we really believe that he is worth abandoning everything for? Do I really believe that? Don't just nod glibly. Do I really believe that? 
Do you and I really believe that Jesus is so good, so satisfying, so rewarding, that we will leave all that we have, all that we own, all that we are, in order to find my fullness only in Him? Do I really believe that? <laughs> Thank you, Terry. You're standing alone, buddy. <laughs> or sitting, whichever the case may be, back there. You know what? It is so easy to say yes and pay lip service. It is so easy to learn Christian ease. You know, we have our own vocabulary. Thank you, Jesus. I'm washed into blood and I'm sanctified. What the heaven does that mean? You know, if you're not part of the vocabulary, it goes right over the top. We have our own Christian ease. But this is a declaration of the heart. It is gripped by a reality that is described by the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3, starting with verse 7. Whatever was to my profit, I consider as loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything as a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish. <laughs> it's not a good word in the Greek. <laughs> means doo-doo. But I want you to notice the word I underlined three times. Paul says, I consider, I consider, I consider. That reflects an attitude of the heart before it ever becomes a reality. Now this is key. Because if you misread what Platt is saying, he is not saying every one of us needs to sell everything and move to the jungle tomorrow. That's not what he's saying. Am I willing to consider things in the perspective of Jesus Christ? Am I willing in perspective to consider his preference and everything else indifferent? Am I willing to consider that he may never call me to lay anything down, but I need to be willing if he does? My associate pastor back in Kansas, Pastor Dave, taught me a simple illustration. He said, Rick, normally we hold things this way. What God wants is that we hold it this way with an open hand. This is me. This is considering it available to the Father if it needs be. My former, now, my martial arts instructor, was a pastor, Pentecostal pastor, named David Brownridge. David was an African American man who impacted my life the way few men have. David was very proud of his Cadillac. <laughs> David and I came out of a demonstration we'd done at a church one night, and somebody had keyed his car all the way down the side. And Brother David looked at that, and he looked at the heavens. Jesus, did you see what they did to your caddy? <laughs> now, we can laugh at it, but understand, he grasped a kingdom perspective. That was not his ride. He held it here, not here. Have we grown to the point where we're learning to hold things and release things and not let the knuckles get white, tight? See, that's what radical surrender is all about. Consider it, consider it, consider it. It's three things as we close this. Number one. Number one, there it is. If you have not yet gotten a copy of David Platt's book, Radical, read it. And if you're like me, if you wanted to throw it away on the first time through, read it again. And when you're done with that one, read it again. I'm on my fourth time going through it. I struggled with it. Brother Robin, you told me you wanted to throw it away a few times. 
Hang in there. I encourage you to finish. And again, I don't necessarily agree with everything, but it will challenge you. Number two. Number two. There it is. You will get the most out of this next nine weeks. I'm going to take, hit it for four weeks, take a breather, hit it for four weeks again. You will get the most out of this if you're not only reading it in the week, but you make a commitment to be here every week, if at all possible. Now, I realize there are many of you, we've got two pilots whose schedules changes. Kai, you can get called out at a moment's notice, brother. I recognize that. But if at all possible, let's commit for the next two months to hear the voice of God as he's going to speak to us together. Number three. If you're not in a small group yet that's doing this as a study, please consider doing that. If none of the small groups are available for you, then we can help you start one. If that don't work, then grab somebody that's reading it and go out for lunch once and discuss the chapter together. As a matter of fact, there are <laughs> I'll go to lunch with you. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Ten years ago, we were attacked. And things changed. And then quickly went right back to normal. My brothers and sisters, normal is nothing more than a setting on your dryer. It is not a spiritual category. I don't want to do normal anymore. Father, we come to you, Lord, as we launch this emphasis, this spiritual exercise. And we come, Father, to a point of decision where each one of us has to make a choice. What am I going to do when I'm confronted by truth? may not like the packaging and may not even like the truth. But what are we going to do to keep from going back to business as normal you have never called your church to thrive by doing business as normal. You are calling us, Father, individually and as a family, to a radical surrender where we give such preference to the Lordship of Jesus that everything else looks like indifference. You called us, Father, and are calling us to be different. Not arrogant, simply different. You call us to follow, not because of what we can receive, but because of who you are and that you alone are worthy. The song of the revelation, worthy is the Lamb who is seated on the throne. That's the only reason. Because you're worthy. Forgive us, Father, when we've made it about what the rewards are worth. And we lay that down in the name of Jesus. And we come to the point, Father, and as the team leads us in a simple song of worship, I surrender all to you. Father, I'm not even sure I know what all that implies. But I do know this. You're teaching me to how to hold things with an open hand and not a closed fist. So, Father, whatever it is you need to do in us, through us, around us this morning, to bring us to that radical point of surrender. Sweet Holy Spirit, loose your power. Do what you need to. As we declare in song together, I surrender, we surrender. All to you. In Jesus' name. Stand up, as is the tradition of Spring Creek. If you've never accepted Jesus as Lord, that is the first point of absolute and radical surrender. If you're not sure that you've ever surrendered to Him, we'll have a couple of our men available, some whip leaders that are available that can pray with you. If you simply need someone to pray over you, we've got a prayer team that will be available as well. Whatever your need, Philippians 4.19, God says, 
I will supply. My God will supply all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ. Do you trust God with a radical surrender?